so uh, the thing we ended with yesterday is the extreme value theorem. The extreme value theorem uh, tells us some circumstances when we're guaranteed to find the maximum, to, guaranteed that there is a, maxim, a maximum or minimum value of a function. Uh, and this, oh. And this set of circumstances is um, is that we have a function which is continuous and uh, that we have an in, um, that we're living on a closed and bounded interval. <clears throat> if any of those fail, the theorem might fail. It might not, but if it doesn't fail, we just got lucky. And and also one another thing to keep in mind is uh, that you can reach the maximum more than once. Nothing's stopping you from reaching it twice or infinitely many times, like with a constant function. So, um, so I drew some examples. So this is a theorem that is very believable if you if you draw some graphs. Do you try to draw a graph of a of a function that is continuous in an interval that includes the endpoints? You always you always find the highest point and the lowest points. Could be could be in the in the endpoints or something. Could could appear more than once, but it's always there. <clears throat> um, So, um, what if the function is not continuous? Um, well, then what happens is that it doesn't work. Even so, <clears throat> even if, uh, if it's just if it's continuous everywhere except for one point, uh, then it doesn't work. For example, this function is continuous everywhere except for the jump, and this function doesn't reach the maximum value. There is a value that is. Um, that is bigger than all of them, but it's not a value of the function because, uh, you know, if this was, uh, since I filled in this point, uh, this thought, say this is one, this is two, and this is three. F of two is not three. Uh, so, the function is not continuous, we're screwed. Uh, this doesn't work. Uh, here's another example where the function is not continuous. And it just doesn't work. Uh, take this function, which, which has an asymptote. So again, it's continuous everywhere except for one point. And, and there's no maximum. So the continuity of the function is super important. Uh, and it's given that for us, continu uh, continuous means that, um, that the limit at every point equals a value, which is, you know, we're not that sure that it agrees with our intuition. Maybe, I don't know how sure we are. <clears throat> Although it does agree, this is like far from saying having anything to do with having a maximum value. This is hard to prove. Um, it's hard to really understand the role of continuity here. Um, what if what 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 did I just write? What is the what is the function? is not continuous. 
so if the function is not continuous, then everything breaks. Um, what if the domain is not closed? Guess what's going to happen? Oh my god. Oh, oh my man. Oh, so he's not responding. What was the question? Um, oh, the question. Oh, wow. The question was, uh, what happens if the domain uh, is not closed? But I think, uh, but yeah, I think everything wants to share. It happens. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, what I was saying is, um, so this theorem needs some, I, I'm claiming it needs some things to work and I'm checking that they do, we do need, we do need these things to work. Sorry. <clears throat> Good enough. You should sue some for that. Yeah, I have I have uh, a lot of lawyers at my disposal. So uh, the the, inter the the extreme value theorem is claiming that it needs a continuous function. It needs a it needs a closed bounded interval, and I'm gonna show you that all of those things are vital for the theorem to work. Um, so I already showed you the function absolutely needs to be continuous, otherwise this is not going to work. Um, so um, if the domain is not bounded, then this function has no maximum. But it, it still has a minimum, right? It still has a minimum, but it, it, I can draw another one that has neither. Um, you're right that that one has a minimum, but let's go like this. So this one starts at the left. So even though the theorem doesn't guarantee that it works, it could happen to work. Uh, and it's important that it sometimes does, but. Uh, there's a difference between, you know, if if you find a continuous function whose domain is closed and bounded and it doesn't have a maximum or minimum, you can sue me. Um, if you, on the other hand, if the domain is not bounded or closed or the function is not continuous, then uh, you might get lucky, find a max or a min or both or neither. Um, I'm not making any claims in that case. So um, uh, lastly, so that's what happens if the domain is not bounded. Um, what if it's not closed? And it's going to be pretty similar. So, um, so for example, so look at this function. Um, again, a function with an asymptote, say two asymptotes, why not? So the domain, the domain is the open interval zero one and the function has a minimum, but it has no maximum. Um, Or even even easier, um, if you just take a function like this on on this open interval, uh, 
there's no max and no min. It's clear where they should be, but they're not there. The, the, um, the function, I didn't define the function there. And these are continuous, by the way. <clears throat> they're continuous in their domain. Okay, so that's the, the extreme value theorem. It's um, incredibly important. Um, but even more important is um, if we know, so even if we know a uh, max or a min exists, How do we find it? Um, this, is, this, this is the question we should be asking because um, we should be, you know, we, we should be asking this question. Um, if I say um, I have a function uh, that tells me how much profit I have depending, depending on how many lollipops my factory makes. I wanna, I wanna make the maximum profit. But uh, if if a mathematician comes and tells me that oh, the, the extreme value theorem tells you that there exists a maximum to your function, so there is a way um, to to find the maximum profit. And then you ask them, okay, but which way is it? And they say, oh, I know it exists, but I have no idea where it is. Then you should slap them probably. Uh, but luckily the mathematician does know how to, how to find the maximum. And that's because, um, maybe right here. Um, that's because The answer is uh, looking at the derivative. So if you have, so here's some differentiable functions with maxes and minimum, minima. Um, so what happens, so The question is, what happens to the tangent line at a maximum or a minimum? <clears throat> so um, sadly, you can't draw these um, because they're on. Um, my device, but um, picture them in your head. What do they? What do they all have in common? In these like graphs here. Yeah. What do them or in any any graph with a max or a min that I could draw? What happens to the tangent line at the at the max? It seems yeah. to be like leveling out, kind of nearing like a solid zero. In these ones, a zero. Uh, what, I what mean, one like mean. that. You mean one? I'm just asking what number is. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a line. Um, so slope is zero, right? So um, I think that's what Pascal meant as well. That the slope is zero. The or how. Normal people say this, uh, it's horizontal. Um, although, in, if you're doing algebra, if we're not graphing, uh, which is a, is a thing that could, I mean, graphing is great, it's super useful, but sometimes it's just impossible. Sometimes the computer just freezes <clears throat> because your functions are too complicated. Um, or the computer gets confused. Uh, so what happens is that they are horizontal. And this means that the slope is zero, and this means that the derivative is zero. So 
And this is, I'm not gonna do it. No time for that. But um, you just honestly write the definition of derivative. Um, and you look at it and that limit has to be, um, it can't be positive and it can be negative. Um, so um, this um, is something that the book calls for mass, for mass here, although um, I don't know about that. There's from uh, from uh, has a lot of much more famous theorems that everyone calls from mass theorem. So I don't know if Stewart is the only person in the world who calls it from mass theorem, and also he's dead, so no one is left to call it from mass theorem. If if a function is differentiable and it has a local maximum or minimum at C. Um, then f prime of prime of C is zero. That's it. Um, so I'm not I'm not promising you that if you call this for math theorem outside of this class, people will know what you mean. People know that differential functions. I have derivative zero at their maxes and mins, but never I had never heard this quote from Matthew before. Um, <clears throat> and if you Google for Matthew, this is definitely not what you'll find. This local, oh yeah, right. Oh. Thank you. Uh, oh, it's it's absolute and relative, not local and global. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, so um, this is what I was just pretty convinced of in a picture. Um, if I have a maximum, there's, the, the slope is going to be uh, the slope is going to be zero. Um, so um, so first of all, first based on based on this theorem, based on this statement. What happens? I said relative. Uh, what happens if f of c is an absolute max, um, maximum instead? Oh, great. Awesome. What happens if if the if the value is the absolute maximum instead of the relative maximum? It's not a trick question. Nothing? Yeah, no, I disagree. Something happens. What happens if you have an absolute maximum or minimum? You're not going to let me edit it. Sorry. Then it's a critical mass. Then it's a critical number. I didn't say what that is. I don't know what that is yet. <clears throat> it depends on the function. No, it doesn't depend on the function. Um, um, would it just be like a constant value since it's zero? Maybe. Oh, well, that isn't. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I understood that. Um, getting a lot of messages. There can only be one absolute max or min. Uh, that's true. But 
it can be it can be reached at more than one point. For example, we could go like this. We reach the same point again, and then maybe it never goes up. Um, then it's on a closed interval method. That's not true. You could have, for example, this function is not on a closed interval. It's in an open interval. If it's in a closed interval, then there's a, an absolute maximum somewhere. Uh, but it doesn't go the other way around. If there's an absolute max or min, it doesn't mean anything out of the interval. So, okay, maybe I was messing with you accidentally. What happens is that any absolute max or min um, is automatically a, um, a relative max or min. So, um, so f prime of c is zero as well. So this theorem tells you something about all kinds of extreme um, extreme points. Um, <clears throat> so um, the next question is, what does this theorem say? So I know this is confusing because I know you're confused. If you're doing which thing. So um, what can we say if f prime of c equals zero? Um, that's a good example. So, um, so the answer is that uh, it could be if we have a, a point of a function where the derivative is zero, we could have a relative maximum or minimum, but we could also not. Um, And the theorem, the theorem is okay with this because it, it tells you that if the function has, has a maximum or minimum, then the derivative is zero. It doesn't tell you that this is the only reason the derivative could be zero. Uh, for example, uh, if you take this function, x cubed, you don't have to go very far to find an example like this. So x cubed looks like... Uh, <clears throat> I'm not inspired today to describe the shape. Uh, it's a it's the two halves of a skinnier parabola stuck together, and the derivative at zero is the following. So let me uh, first. So how how do you find the derivative at zero? You take the derivative. And only then do you plug in uh, x equals 0. If you do it in the opposite order, you're going to plug a number into the derivative. You're going to get a constant. You're going to get 0 always. Uh, so the derivative of the function is 3x squared. So f prime of 0 is 0. <clears throat> so um, the tangent line to this function is horizontal at this point, but it's not a max or a min. So, and, and this doesn't mean the theorem is wrong. It means this is not what the theorem was talking about. The theorem wasn't saying what happens when the derivative is zero. It was saying what happens when you have a max or a min. If I say uh, if it rains, I'm going to get wet. Um, so if I say this, um, what happens if I get wet? Um, 
um, it, it could happen still that if, if this was true, that if it rains, uh, I get wet, I could still um, get wet without it raining um, because I fell into the river. <clears throat> Right. This is what this is what if means. It means if the thing is true, uh, if the premise is true, then the consequence is true. But if the consequence is true, then the premise could be true or false. Um, so um, if f of c is a maximum or a minimum, then uh, f prime of c equals zero. <clears throat> okay, um, so so this is all we need to know. This is so now we can find. Um, so here's the um, here's how you find the maxima and min extreme the extreme values of a function. Say say and I close on the interval so that they're guaranteed that it exists. So um, what do you do? So you have a function. Um, so this is this is great um, because I can just give you steps. Find the derivative. Step two, um, find um, all the solutions to the derivative equals to zero. So this is going to be you have your function, your your derivative, and you set it equal to zero, and you solve for x, um, and you find these and what you also need to do is find all the places uh, where a prime of x does not exist. Exist. Um, which will always include the endpoints because uh, we can't really take the derivative at the end of an interval. <clears throat> so the theorem, of course, if the if the derivative doesn't exist, there could still be an extreme point there. Uh, because then the theorem is not saying anything. It's saying the theorem works if the function is differentiable. If the function is not differentiable, then it, there could be a, a maximum or a minimum. So um, what you can do, uh, the, the next step is you have a list of points. Um, if so, then you say, um, so these points, all of these are called critical points. Um, I don't know why we call them critical points. I guess they are pretty critical. Uh, but we care about them because these are the points. If there's a maximum or a minimum, which there has to be, it's going to be one of these. It's going to be either the endpoints or the places where you don't have a derivative or the places where the derivative is zero. Because that's what the Fermat theorem says. It says if, if, there is, if there is a derivative, then it's zero. So two things could happen. Either there's not a derivative, and the theorem doesn't apply, or the derivative is zero. Uh, and 
the so then what you know is that the max and min is at one is at some of these of the critical points. So how can you figure out which one? Um, you can just find uh, the function, the value of the function at all the critical points. And the maximum is the largest value. And the minimum is the smallest. And that's it. Um, so um, with the stuff that we know, you can just get a recipe with just like, you know, um, I mean, it involves solving an equation, which is always a bit scary. Uh, solving equations is hard. Um, but if we know how to solve the equation, we just have a recipe. We don't have to think uh, when we do this problem. We just do step one, step two, step three, and, and we're done. Uh, honestly, this is so useful because finding maximum values and minimum values is, is just incredibly useful. And if you, if you only learn one thing in this class, um, I think you know, it should be this slide. If I had to pick one thing, honestly. <clears throat> so let's do an example, or more than one. Uh, let's find the maxes. And also, as a side product, when we get the, the relative max, maxes and mins, um, they're somewhere in there, although we don't yet know how to tell them apart. Uh, which one do you want to take? X minus two sine x. Uh, between zero and two pi. So um, this function is easy enough to graph, but let's not do it and show. Honestly, it's equally easy with algebra. And with algebra, we find the exact solution. So um, step one, what was step one? I don't have to think. So um, the only thing I have to think about is um, this is continuous. This is uh, closed because it includes the it includes the endpoints and and it's bounded. It's bounded by zero and two pi. <clears throat> so um, so step one, what was step one? Take the derivative. Hold on, I'm looking. Let me just copy it again. Uh, so the derivative. Um, Uh, well, it's the derivative of x minus the derivative of 2 sine x. Uh, the derivative of x is 1 by the power rule. The 2 comes out of the derivative. And the derivative of sine is cosine. I just know that by heart. Um, so that's step 1. Step 2. Solve the equation f prime of x equals zero. Uh, the, the answers are the critical points. Um, or a derivative doesn't exist. So where does the derivative not exist? Well, the function one minus two cosine x is defined everywhere. Uh, but um, you gotta not forget the endpoints because you you can't take a derivative at, at the endpoints um, because you need to take the limit um, from both sides. 
I would say this, you know, this doesn't doesn't have a tangent here. Even though the formula is differentiable, like if we extended the domain, it would be. But if we just look at this interval, it's not. So um, one important thing to, one easy thing to mess up is to forget about the endpoints. So um, that's it. So the so now we write this equation and we solve it. So I'm solving the equation one minus two uh, minus two cosine x equals zero. <clears throat> that means that uh, two cosine x equals one. That means that cosine x is one half. So um, what are what are the angles with cosine one half? So there's a circle. Isn't it one over the square root of two or something? The angle? The angle is not one over the square root of two. Pi over three. And not by the letter, pi the asserts. Um so if the x coordinate in the unit circle is um is one half, uh, we have this angle, which is 60 degrees, which indeed is pi over three. And then we have this other angle, which is the opposite. So x is, um, are there three negative pi over three? Are there more answers? Are there any questions? Is it possible that I'm messing with you and I did this wrong? I asked too many questions. I don't know which one you're saying no to. I mean, outside the interval, yeah, but it's a closed interval. So within that interval, those are the two answers. In that interval, so in the interval between zero and two pi, these are the two answers. I'm messing with you. What am I doing wrong? Wouldn't the answer just be pi over three because negative pi over three is less than zero? Negative pi over three is definitely less than zero. Um, this is definitely not in the interval. So, uh, so wouldn't it be where cosine's positive and that's in quadrant one and two? So wouldn't it be pi over three and two pi over three? No, uh, cosine is the x corner. So cosine is positive on the right. So that's quadrants one and four. Uh, you're, what you're saying is sine where sign is positive. You're right, my bad. Um, five pi over three. Oh, there you go, Matthew. Five pi over three, then. So this angle, um, this angle is negative, but if I write, if I draw this angle, that one is between zero and 360. Um, the, the angle, that should be two. The angle five pi over three is in the interval. <clears throat> all right, so uh, that's all the answers because there's two points on the circle, and zero to two pi is going one only one lap around. 
So um, the critical points are 0, pi over 3, 5 pi over 3, 2 pi. And the derivative alone, yeah. Well, you'll see. We'll, we'll see some more things we can do with the derivative. But right now, I don't know which is which. Um, I don't, uh, but an easy way to tell, which is doing step three. So I have zero pi over three, five pi over three, two pi. Step three is find f of x for all critical points. Um, Remember that the, in this case, the function is, what's the function? It's x minus 2 sine x. So uh, just plug in four values of the function. So before today, you would have done this problem, I guess, by plugging infinitely many values of this function and looking for the biggest one. It's essentially what graphing is. But now, I only need to do this four times, which is a lot less than infinitely many. So the sine of zero is zero. So this is zero. Uh, pi over three, um, I have pi over three minus two sine of pi over three. And I know my special angles. Also, I just found that the cosine is one half for this one, so the sign has to be negative, um, has to be root two over two. So pi over three minus root three. Uh, f of two pi over three, uh, pi pi over three, is pi pi over three um, minus two sine pi pi over three. So on the circle, here is five pi over three. The sine sine is negative. It's negative root three over two. Or you know, use a calculator. Uh, so five pi over three, and then there's two minus signs. So just be careful about that, because everything falls to pieces if you. If if you end up if, if you mess up a minus sign at the last step, and two, f of two pi is two pi minus um, two sine of two pi, and the sine of two pi is the same thing as the sine of zero, so this is just two pi. So I have four values, and now all I need to do is stare at them and decide which one is the biggest and which one is the smallest. So um, just for funsies, of course, we can use a calculator. Uh, but it never hurts to exercise your brain a little bit. Um, which is which is the largest? Oh, uh, I asked you a question and then they disappear. So out of these four numbers, which is the biggest and which is the smallest? Zero and two pi. Uh, new. Is that is that like no? I don't know what I don't know what a new is. That's like some some Gen Z stuff that I that sounds to me. Ah, oh. um, so, um, what was this one? Zero five pi over three. Um, all right, I have two opinions. <clears throat> pi over three minus root 
5 pi over 3 plus root 3 and 2 pi. Sydney is right. Um, I want to bore you. Oh. What? Never mind, I think I'm right. Sounds like a typical college discussion, more cross ball. Where everyone just agrees with Sydney. Um okay, there's there's your four numbers. Choose the largest and the smallest. You gotta choose two of those. Three votes. Oof. So, how many decimals of root three do you know in your head? Oh, the, the race is tightening. Wow, so close. Okay, I'm gonna give you 10 more seconds to reply. Nine, eight. Three, two, one. Ooh, some one person voted in the, in the last second. Uh, so zero, one, ooh. I don't think that, I don't think zero is the, the largest. I think it's the two middle ones. Um, so, uh, I'm pretty sure, so, okay, well, um, I don't know who answered what, but you can, you, you will know if you did it right or not. Uh, I'm pretty sure pi over three minus root three is negative. Because uh, this would mean that pi over three is smaller than root three. Uh, for example, if I square this, it's saying that pi squared divided by nine is smaller than three. So this is saying that pi squared is smaller than 27. Uh, and this is true because pi is smaller than four. Can we say that the zero is not a, well, I didn't say anything. Some people said some things. Uh, I don't know what you said, Dustin, but uh, it's not the min, it's not the max either, because there's a negative number here. Uh, so this is the min. And out of, the, out of these two, um, this one is bigger for the same reason. Um, two pi, is smaller than pi pi over three plus root three. This is the same as saying that pi over three is smaller than root three. Uh, by subtracting the pi pi over three. But it doesn't matter. This is just to see if your brain is working. So ah uh, uh, now the class is over. Let me let me just graph it for a second. Uh to see if we did it correctly or not. Uh, x minus two sine x, uh, where x is smaller than zero, smaller than two pi. So um, this point, oh, we even know pi over three is the minimum, like we just said, and this number is um, pi over three minus root three, and pi pi over three is the maximum, and this number is indeed um, pi pi over three plus root three. And at zero, we have a number that's in between. Okay, this is undefined because. Oh, oh, wow, that works. Incredible. At zero, we have zero, and at two pi, we have two pi. 
which is smaller than the biggest value. So there you go, we figured this thing out. You know, the computers did a lot more computations than we did. So we figured this thing out with only algebra. We are um, so wise. This is this is an incredibly useful skill to have. Um,